go. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So thank you all for joining. Uh, today we're going to be um, talking about the MURA. It's a large data set for abnormality detected in MSK radiographs. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that we're active on Twitter. We have a res uh, hashtag. It's RedAIJC here on the left lower corner. Um, so you can follow along uh, and add to the discussion. And we also post our recordings on YouTube. Um, and you can follow the, the link on my last slide. So today we'll be talking about the MURA. As I said, this is an um, initiative by the Stanford group. Uh, and they have this competition, they have a leaderboard, and everyone is allowed to participate and have their own algorithm and test it against all, all of these different ones. Uh, they also published a paper out of this data set and their own algorithm, and we'll be discussing that along with our guests. So we have two guests today. One is Dr. Anouk Stein. He's a radiologist and developer working at MD.ai, which is a platform used for annotating data sets. And we also have uh, another guest, uh, Sarivia, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, um, Turo Kovalor, uh, machine learning engineer in the domains of big data, machine learning, and open source, passionate about connecting technical capabilities to problems worth solving. Currently working at Adobe, also co-founder at impactai.org. So I will um, share my screen with the, one of our guests, and uh, maybe we can start with Dr. Stein. Um, yes, hi. Um, so we're going to be discussing uh, Mura, and they have a they had a, a really nice large data set that they made available. Um, out of 14,000 images, there are only 12,000 patients, so it's a nice set because there aren't too many duplications. And one of the things that I noted uh, was in their data collection that they made sure not to have an overlap in patients between the validation test and training sets, because that can be a, a big problem. And a lot of the public data sets available, um, you'll sometimes see patients with 18, 20, 25 studies um, and you, you may be just training on that one particular patient if you have them across multiple sets. Do you, um, I'm sorry, do you have slides, Dr. Stein, or we are uh, just discussing it? Um, and we can share the screen with you or we can keep our own screen. Um, no, I'm sorry, I do not have uh, slides. I can uh, share the article. Uh, if you want to, it's fine. Uh, we can. I can also share uh, our annotator with the Muro project that we currently have up, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think that's good, the annotation platform, because I think we want to. So let me uh, sort of give a little bit of context here. Um, so. Uh, a group of 24 people, you know, some of whom are on the call, like uh, led by Alexandra, are working together to uh, on the Mura data set with, you know, a composition of radiologists. And so uh, the purpose of this session is to talk about what to think about working with data sets. And, you know, especially because the role of the radiologists, be, even beyond, uh, before they um, get involved with, um, with doing algorithms is that most of us will get involved with data annotation. And so at the end of this session, you know, one thing we want you to sort of be thinking about is if you get a job or calls, you know, to serve in the, as an annotator, what that entails, what that looks like. And so, you know, um, 
uh, Dr. Stain, if you want to, you know, sort of walk through some how how you annotate an image uh, because this Mura data set is loaded on your platform. You know what people think about what are the labels. I think that would be really helpful in giving people who are online a visual sort of feeling of the data set and some of the feedback you've had. Sure, absolutely. So we loaded, um, these are all the training data, and then we also have the validation data. Um, so we loaded them on the platform, and we, um, these are uh, all the users with it, and we gave them different assignments. And the idea, we, we have the uh, original mural labels, but these are hidden to each uh, person. And, and then also, like, my annotations would be hidden to uh, the second reader. So we tried to have two readers for each one. Um, what we decided to do was we had the weak labels from uh, the original Stanford group, but we also decided to put bounding boxes around fractures, hardware, including casts. We, um, we went, decided for, on joint disease and tumors, and we did this based on, uh, from the article, they, they took a sample of 100 cases just to kind of see what kind of granularity there was, and, and that, that was pretty much the general distribution. And then we have uh, categories for an entire normal exam, or sometimes there's just a normal image within an exam that, that may have a, you know, a fracture or, or a hardware. And then what we were able to do, uh, part of the, once about half of the set was annotated and we could see the progress over here. Um, and this is, says all of it because all the Mura had labeled everything. But once we, we'd seen the progress, we were able to, uh, uh, we have a way to download uh, export the um, annotations, and then one of our group members trained it to look at the hardware. So uh, I can show you, sorry. So in this set, uh, if I filter just for the hardware, we had, and I know where to look. So if I filter for the hardware, uh, you can see the machine learning uh, tab. So this is what the, the machine learning, and, and this was just the initial um, kind of look through to see how would it do on something really easy. Hardware is pretty easy. And so this is the machine learning tab, and now we're going to have the annotators go through and either upvote it, downvote it, or, you know, maybe lengthen this a little bit. Um, but it, it actually did a, a pretty nice job. And then the idea would also be to iterate. So you get the first pass with a human, uh, train a model, then have the humans go and, and adjust uh, the boxes and then retrain it and maybe iterate that a few times until you've got something that really doesn't need to be adjusted anymore. Um, so, um and I don't want to sort of um, preempt the question time, but could you sort of approach uh, how would how would you know a radiologist? I know you double both in um, you know as a radiologist and also as a developer. How do you sort of um, get in? You know, if you if someone approaches you and says, "Hey, can you annotate data for me?" You know, how do you approach it? How do you think about it? What questions should be should you be asking? Because we know that the radiologist's time is pretty expensive and is a barrier to actually deep learning. That's a that's a really good point, Judy. And I mean, there are some uh, 
there were some CT scans where the whole thing was annotated and they gave an estimation of the time and they said it took four hours for one scan and that would be very, very expensive. And um, although segmentation is really the goal, so that to have things like really kind of nicely scalpeled out almost, that's so expensive that starting with bounding boxes is a really fast, uh, cheap way to go. You just can make pretty sloppy bounding boxes um, and then do, you know, with iteration, I think that's a much cheaper way where you're training it and then, um, you know, re-annotating, re, uh, kind of just manipulating the, the boxes and then training it again. Um, but the real goal would be, you know, say if you had a liver, just to have that really beautifully segmented out and have the vessel segmented out and, and really almost like a pixel by pixel analysis and the same thing with, with tumors uh, within an organ. But you're right, it's, it's just way, way too expensive. Um, and, but I think that radiologists are really the ones to be driving this because right now the bottleneck is data, and, that, and that's what this article is saying. And uh, any of the public data that we're getting, it's, it's kind of like we just have to take what we get, right? But radiologists have access to all the images in their hospital every day, and, um, and you know, with the appropriate IRB, they, uh, they're in the best position to kind of uh, create these data sets, annotate them, and start doing the machine learning. Thank you so much. We will um, open up for questions if uh, people have in the in the chat if you have a question you can uh, type in uh, and after that we will move to the next guest you can also save the questions for the end I don't see any questions right now so we will move on to the next guest um, and we'll share his uh, screen. We'll move to um, Travia and yeah, oh, she does uh, her screen. Okay, very good. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Shravya Turukovilur. Um, yeah, it's my, uh, you know, absolute uh, privilege to be talking to all of you today. Um, thank you, Judy, Patricia, and uh, Katie, uh, and the team uh, for uh, inviting me over. Um, yeah, so Judy has asked me to talk about uh, uh, review Mura dataset paper. Uh, and also share uh, some of the insights uh, from industry when talking about uh, uh, when creating data sets. So, hmm, one second, why, okay. Um, so my goal here is to be useful for, uh, you know, the audience here. So can I get a rough sense of how many might be already familiar with deep learning, Judy? Um. That is a good question. So I have, at least I have a window to look at the attendees. And uh, we have people who are extremely vast with um, deep learning, like Alexandre and Rikia. Mm -hmm. And we have people who are in the medium sort of place okay. where they understand a little bit and can read that paper, the Mura paper. and. Okay. We also have people who sort of make influence decisions and sort of hold leadership positions. I see Geraldine and Bib Allen online and uh, Charles Khan. And so uh, we have a very hybrid mix. And unfortunately, okay. actually, as we've gone along, we've dropped some of the non-technical people. But we have, you know, there's no 
I always learn something else. Don't worry about being too basic or anything. <laughs> okay, okay. So apologies and also for... Your slides, <laughs> your slides are not... I just see one on slide number one. I don't know if you're moving to the next slide. Yeah, but... I'm, on the, I'm on the context slide now. Do you see context? No. Huh. That is interesting. Okay, now I see it. Oh, you see it now? So yeah. if it's on the present mode, do you see it now? No. Oh, I still see it, but I still, I see in like all uh, non oh, I see, I see. I don't know how to, uh, let me see one second. Um, oh. Can you see it now? Yep. Exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And actually, so... you know, the attendees, just, uh, it will be interesting to see how, you know, what people are at right now because we are seven months later. Uh, if you don't mind just stepping in the sort of like the question and answer section where you are in the deep learning spectrum. Zero for no, nothing, and 10 for expert. It will be interesting to, to sort of do a, a poll yeah. right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll wait till we, we get the results. And go ahead. But okay. some are coming. Okay. We have zero, one, five, four coming in. But yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think, yeah, uh, that's good enough information. So uh, apologies for already experts. There'll be some, um, you know, uh, things which you already know, but I think I'll keep, try to keep it short at the same time trying to, uh, you know, uh, make sure this makes sense for everyone. Um, yeah, so a rough, uh, I, I just wanted to get, you know, set the context why we're discussing for people who are new. Um, so deep learning uh, in the past half decade has made a lot of progress, mainly to do three pillars, right? So compute, uh, lots of uh, GPUs, algorithms, uh, uh, slightly, you know, uh, newer uh, algorithms, and lots of data. And uh, um, a lot of progress has actually come from supervised learning, so that's the that's the uh, reason we need labeled data, not just data, but we need labeled data. So, for people who are new to supervised learning, a uh, simple way to uh, put it is you train the model on lots of x y pairs, and uh, for a given new x new, you have to your model has to predict y new. So. Uh, so that's supervised learning. So um, Andre Karpati, uh, director of a AI at Tesla, has recently given a talk about software 2.0 stack. And um, he's really put forward the idea that data set labeling and the labeling infrastructure are going to be the key uh, going forward because most of the algorithms, uh, we are you know, slowly getting to a point where it's possible to auto-generate some of these algorithms. And uh, given enough data, we might be able to solve many things. So <clears throat> having said that, uh, in so most, my talk will be, you know, um, coming from industry as I've been working in the industry on not on medical problems, on very different problems. So uh, I hope at least some of these will be applicable to medical and radiology domains. Um, and uh, when talking about data set creation, uh, in industry, we usually collect data to solve one specific problem, right? So it could be if it's an e-fashion company, uh, you might want to um, classify the output outfits into known classes so that you can have like better discoverability of the inventory, right? Or if you're a self-driving car company, um, you might be interested in detecting objects on the road to, make, to feed into your decision process. So that's data set creation for a specific problem. But there's also, you might want to create a data set to build the representations of your domain. Uh, so what I mean by that is, uh, for, uh, for example, ImageNet, right? ImageNet is a very popular data set in deep learning, uh, which kind of really moved the needle in the deep learning ecosystem. Um, it consists of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, millions of images. And uh, when I first looked at some of the medical imaging problems, I was quite surprised that, um, you know, uh, a classifi classification on x-rays actually use models pre-trained on ImageNet. 
uh, ImageNet has um, images of dogs and cats, which look nothing like uh, radiographs, right? But still, it works pretty well. So uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to see like a you know radiograph net. Um, I think that will really accelerate what uh, we can do in uh, very specific domains like radiology. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll be uh, mainly focusing on solving specific tasks, but many of these also apply for the second category. So, um, so once you start, you know, the problem, um, it's important to define the problem well. Uh, as uh, uh, yeah, so for the people who are new uh, to uh, machine learning, this is a you know, when talking about computer vision problems, these are the very commonly used for techniques, uh, classification, which means given an image, uh, say if it's you know abnormal X-ray or a normal X-ray, right? And uh, classification plus localization is where you say it is abnormal, but also put a bonding box around some abnormality, right? And uh, you can have object detection where you can have multiple kinds of abnormalities, for example, um, um, and uh, put bonding boxes around each of these. And you can also do instant segmentation. So not just bonding box, but at pixel level, you can actually classify into one of the known abnormalities. So it's really important to first formulate your problem into one of these classes or potentially more, but these are the regularly used classes. And uh, once you have that, uh, <clears throat> it's really important if you're using a classification, for example, to have your classes uh, mutually exclusive. Um, this looks very intuitive and obvious, but I've seen uh, I've seen many cases where uh, the classes are not mutually exclusive, which causes uh, problems down the line. And um, uh, sometimes you might also have a other class. Uh, for example, if you're talking about classifying an image as indoor or outdoor, um, some images might be really hard even for humans to say that if it's a very close-up image, for example. So in those cases, sometimes you might decide to have a other class, which, you know, like a catch everything other than the, these two classes. Or you can, if it's a binary classification, you can also decide to, you know, play with the thresholds uh, to decide where you are. Uh, uh, so anything which is not confident can go into this category. Uh, by the way, uh, feel free to stop me anytime for questions. Uh, so the next question usually which we ask is, how much data do I really need to solve this problem? And that depends on if you're using transfer learning or not. If you're using transfer learning, uh, again, it really depends on how close your uh, data set and task are to your, you know, the original data set and task. Um, and in my experience, a few thousand uh, training samples for each class work pretty well when transfer learning. And if you're not doing transfer learning, uh, it really depends on the complexity of the problem uh, and the model complexity. Um, so when collecting the, in, in the labeling process, uh, in the industry, most of the labeling is, doesn't require domain expertise. So what that means is most of, most of the labeling is outsourced. Uh, so when outsourcing these, um, labeling processes, it, we usually write, you know, guiding questions. And it's extremely important to remove as much ambiguity as possible when framing these questions. Uh, because at least in the real, you know, world, there are all kinds of crazy edge cases. Uh, so this is one example, right? So is this one car, two car, three car, or four cars, right? So um, uh, it's important to define, okay, uh, uh, but it might be, you know, uh, in such cases, put bonding box as just one one card, right? So uh, there are also all sorts of edge cases, and people do get confused. Okay, what do I label this as? And uh, uh, it's important to provide very clear instructions to remove the ambiguity. And uh, having said that labeling uh, is a very iterative process right once you start labeling you'll realize that there are these edge cases which are very ambiguous uh, and uh, then you want to fine-tune your guiding questions um, 
and uh, label again and you know do this iteratively um, and uh, one more thing uh, uh, especially if you're outsourcing um, what we do usually is uh, have uh, um, uh, use the performance of the annotators so we uh, intersperse the labeling process with some test questions where we actually already know the label to get a baseline performance of annotators and then we wait perf uh, annotators who are doing really well more and performers um, annotators who are not doing very well on though um, yeah so um, when talking about data set I think it's really important to understand some uh, 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 that bias can creep in in many ways, and some of the ways bias can creep in, so that we keep an eye on that. Um, so um, <laughs> there are mainly two ways bias keeps in, uh, pre creeps in. One is the data collection itself. Like, uh, are you collecting enough data uh, to for all demographics? Right. Uh, it's the data is collected in. Um, U.S. on a in a very rich neighborhood, um, is it going to really capture uh, you know other ethnicities or things like that? Or it can also be based on time period, especially in industry that's very common. Like you've collected data in uh, you know uh, in two thousand four to two thousand eight, but things have changed a lot since then, right? So um, um, things like that, and also in the labeling process. Um, in many cases, the we use the term ground truth, right? But uh, ground truth can actually have a lot of biases uh, based on how the labelers uh, have labeled. So it could be either because of your uh, guiding questions, or it could be because of just the biases in the annotators, right? Or if your labeling process is semi-automated, where it's you know using some historic data, then that historic data will bring in the historic biases with it. So um, yeah, so one thing we usually do to understand uh, um, uh, how good our data set is and how model is, especially after we have a model, is uh, you know uh, chart out the ROC curves for various slices of your data. Like how is how, how does my ROC curve look for uh, you know uh, um, people of color, for example, or um, uh, people uh, who are bigger than this, uh, bigger than 60, uh, I mean, older than 60, things like that. Um, yeah, as Dr. Anna uh, mentioned, uh, it's really important to um, uh, how you split your train validation and test sets, because data can leak in between these sets and uh, your model could be just learning this leak, right? Instead of learning the actual features. So for one example is patients overlapping with, uh, between different sets. So, um, or it could be um, some apparatus uh, overlapping between different sets. So once the model understands how to detect this apparatus, um, and if, um, okay, let me rephrase that. So imagine you have data set where uh, you have apparatus A and apparatus B, and you're getting all your uh, normal data sets from apparatus A and abnormal data sets from uh, 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 apparatus B, um, which might look fine initially, but your model would, would be learning that to detect the apparatus instead of the actual features. So things like that. This is a, a kind of overblown example, but things like that happen. Another thing about test set is uh, make sure to make sure the test set is like as close as your real world prox outcomes. So, for example, in chest X ray paper, like they just randomly split the data set uh, into test set. Um, the, the labeling process was flawed. So, even though your model really works well on test set, it doesn't really mean much because your labeling process was wrong. So um, that's one thing I really liked about uh, 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 Mura dataset that uh, they actually have a very good test set where they have like uh, various radiologists uh, rate and uh, pick three people from ra uh, random. Um, yeah, so 
So that's the uh, some of the insights that I wanted to share but coming from um, industry. With respect to MURA dataset paper, um, yeah, so it's a binary classification problem, um, normal and abnormal, so it looks mutually exclusive. Um, the labeling process seems pretty solid uh, that, uh, you know, the actual domain experts looked at the data and labeled it. Um, the test set also looks good, as uh, I've mentioned, and there's no data leakage between uh, train valid test plot. And uh, class distribution looks good. Um, so one thing here which happens is you have lots of normal data samples and very few abnormal samples then it becomes very hard for the model to learn these minority uh, representations. Uh, but here, that looks good too. So those are some of the points I gather reading the paper. Um, yeah, so um, that is all I have. I, I'll be happy to take questions. I think one of the things that, that I really liked about the Muir paper that you pointed out, Shravya, is that they're, they're looking at, at normal versus abnormal, that it's a really clear, clear um, problem. But right. then with, within that, we're seeing the variability of some of the best radiologists in the country. Um, so, so that's where medical um, annotation diverges from maybe looking at, at objects or cats and dogs. Because if 100 people look at a cat, we, we would all agree, like, yes, that's right. a cat. And he, here we have six, six top radiologists not agreeing on, especially the fingers, right? They, they had a huge problem with the fingers. And, and I even yeah. uh, wrote to uh, the, the authors asking, what, what do you think happened with the fingers? And, and they, they just didn't know. They said, well, you know, it's maybe it's just subtle. Um, but I think the, the normal versus not normal uh, dichotomy is, is a really great uh, first step with, with medical data sets because it's low-hanging fruit. And as we know, and luckily for the patients, most studies are going to be normal. And what the article pointed out was that, you know, we could really use this for triage in a great way. If we can reliably find normal studies with machine learning, um, we, we've already done, you know, a pretty good service. We've already come a, a, a pretty good way. So I wondered if you could comment on that, Shravi or Judy. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. I don't know enough about medical uh, domain to uh, authoritatively say anything here. But yeah, so the the more clear your problem formulation is, the better the model performs also. But yeah, it's an interesting point that you raised that, uh, yeah, there's a lot more disagreement in this space, in this domain than, you know, uh, cat and dog, for example, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I wonder, yes. So in, so there are some cases in industry as well where things are very ambiguous. And the way we, uh, as I mentioned, one of the things we use is test questions. But I wonder, like, can we actually rate right. <laughs> radiologists in the annotation process too? I don't know. Um, because it's not just their, you know, track record, but they might be just, you know, tired that day, right? So, um, yeah. And we may need to use more comprehensive data. We may need to use data over time. We may need to compare MR to the, the plain radiograph to see if there actually was a fracture, and there was some subtle erosion that, that you know, we just couldn't pick up and see if a machine learning algorithm could pick that up. Um, one of the things right. you did point out that, that uh, you know, I, I just, just so agree with is that you have to be careful what you're actually training. Because on uh, one very large data set, the chest x-ray 14, um, the machine was learning that if something had a portable sticker, it was more likely to be abnormal. Well, mm -hmm. portable films are taken in patients who are, who are sicker, they're in the ICU. Uh, it's a pretty good bet that <laughs> a portable <laughs> film is gonna be worse and the machine had, had learned that and that really didn't add anything. So that was a good point that, that you made. Right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's funny that uh, uh, 
data leakage can happen in so many ways. Um, um, yeah, many times we celebrate that model is working well until we test on, you know, real data and nothing seems to work. And then we go back and like fix the data leakage. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Uh, that was a great presentation, Sravia. Uh, we have a few Thank questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'll start uh, asking a few of them. Uh, one is about um, if we can use cheaper ways of annotating the data, for example, um, utilizing structured reports. And I know that there are pros and cons to that. And if you can comment and expand uh, a little bit on uh, what what's the, the pros and cons of using a radiologist to annotate the images de novo versus using the structure reports. Well, as Judy pointed out, the radiologist is just the most expensive way of annotating. And the structure reports, you're already taking a radiologist's opinion. So that's a, a really great way um, to start, especially to get some weak labels and, and at least um, get an initial algorithm and then check and see how well it does. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, so also, uh, as uh, Dr. Nanook showed, that the, the annotation process is uh, AI-assisted, right? So there is some algorithm which is showing you the weak bonding boxes. Similarly, I think we can use uh, the structured data that we have to bootstrap this labeling process as well. Um, yeah, but as chest X-ray, uh, you know, uh, paper has pointed out, uh, I would love to know your thoughts, uh, you know, the radiologist's thoughts on it, but it was um, in Dr. Luke's uh, blog post, which you probably are aware of, um, mm -hmm. it's mentioned uh, that, you know, there's like many, many ways of people reporting problems at interpretation time, and uh, they don't necessarily, you know, capture the labels, right? And they might, uh, uh, so there's a lot of noise looks like. I don't know if all of you agree with that or uh, 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 how safe do you feel these reports are in terms of capturing the words, right? Like the keywords and. Uh, it, it really depends. I mean, the more structured the report, the better. So like mm -hmm. in breast radiology, we have a very structured way of talking about um, the findings called BIRADS. And we have something similar for the liver called LRADS. Um, but yeah, for the chest, th there are standards from the Fleischner Society, but it seemed like there were a lot of terms being used that are out of uh, favor. So mm -hmm. that is, is really the first challenge is to get radiologists using the same language for the same entities. So that's a good point. Oh, that's great. Um, another question we have is um, more of an ethical question. I think that a lot of organizations, they, um, they face the challenge of getting the data. Uh, there are some concerns about uh, patient data getting um, outside of the organization. So um, how, how can we overcome those challenges and um, those ethical, ethical um, concerns. I mean, that's that is the big question, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe the key is um, to, uh, to just like we have um, these ResNets weights, and and Shravno talked about if we had like a medical image net maybe uh, people could train their own models and make the, the, the models and the model weights available. And this way they kept all the images private, but they're sharing a lot of information that, that other people can use on their data sets to, to further learning. Yeah, absolutely like that idea, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, just to add to that, uh, yeah, it's a very important problem when you're question to ask, and uh, we should all be thinking about it. Um, so on one side, you know, you, 
you you should definitely be on anonymize all the data um, before you bring it to you know any um, system like this um, also um, I think uh, as uh, Dr. Anuk mentioned we can offload most of the parts which require to see a lot of images to basically we can separate out these two things right where we train on these huge data sets and where we might decide to fine tune on uh, a specific, uh, you know, maybe uh, a very specific problem. I don't know what it what it would be, but a very specific problem. As well as we can also uh, use these models on device at inference time, so that we're not really sending custom, you know, the client data to a service which is hosted potentially on AWS or something, right? So if you can compress the uh, model enough, and if you can run inference right on, you know, the doctor's laptop or whatever uh, um, on a CAD system, right? I think that also like removes a lot of friction. Like you're not uh, sharing this data with anything and uh, doing all the processing locally, so it's much more secure. Well, that's great. Uh, we have a related question since you mentioned outsourcing. Uh, we have a question from Cyrus Saidapur. He's asking uh, if you recommend any third party service to outsource the data labeling. Well, MDAI will do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's great. So there, there you we Call us. We'll do it. Very good. Um, and a question from Brian Gilchrist. Um, are th do you know if those, um, the radiologists in the Stanford program, they are um, generalist or MSK trained radiologists? Because uh, that would make a difference in terms of accuracy. Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Um, they, they gave the, the number of years of experience. Um, did, does anyone else know? Maybe not. The I did not see MSK on them. I also just saw the number of it, the experience. Right. That's a very good pickup. Yeah. Uh, they said they were board certified, but it, that's that's a good uh, thing, and some of them only had two years experience, so they right they might be in the middle of fellowship. So yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and that would definitely that would definitely uh, change the results. Mm -hmm. We have another question from John Pineda. He's asking if for uh, the calculation and have a statistical significance if there are specific number of studies that should be in the data set? That is it's so hard to answer um, because it really depends on what question you're trying to ask. And often you don't know until you're just not getting an answer and you just need more data. But one of the things you do want to look out for, and, and he's right about that, is you want to make sure you have enough examples of something. So like the way we're uh, annotating Neura is we're still trying to look at normal versus not normal, but we're trying to make it a little bit more granular to give it more things to learn. But if you don't have enough, say we had very, very few bone tumors, well, that might be a terrible category and we should just roll that into other if we don't have enough examples. So that, that would that would uh, be how I would answer that question. That's great. Uh, we have a, a, actually a comment from Dr. Bib Allen about um, one of the prior questions in, in terms of the structure, using structure reports. And he makes a point that uh, we'll probably need a uh, hybrid strategy if we want to use the structure reports because those are done for clinical purposes and to communicate with the clinical team and not specifically to train in AI algorithms. So if that's the intent, we will probably need a hybrid um, strategy. And we have a question from uh, Mohammed 
Posny, and if um, it is, it will be possible for students to make preliminary annotations that can be reviewed and validated by a radiologist, if that will be um, effective. Yes, we've actually found that very effective and we're, we're doing that now. We have a couple of students that we have annotating a different project and, and then we have radiologists uh, kind of supervising them and fine tuning uh, what they're doing and teaching them. And that, that is a really good approach and a much, um, much better than trying to get radiologists to do it, yeah. You found that that was faster than actually having the radiologists to do it? Well, it's hard. Um, it's just so expensive to get radiologists to do it, right? Radiologists are, they have other jobs that are well paid. Um, so students are really the way to go. So that is a, a great question um, because you just, there just aren't enough radiologists to do this stuff. And when and, you say uh, students, are you referring to um, radiology residents or uh, medical students? Medical students and I, one of the people I'm, I'm training is a pre-med student. And it, you know, it's really what Shravya was saying is that there, there are a lot of things that um, if you really define the problem well, you don't need specialists for. If you have the problem well defined, you can train someone to um, you know, look for a certain pattern. Shravya, yeah. I have a question for you, and I'm sorry for <laughs> pronouncing your name wrong. Um, no. Could you could you clarify? I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. But could you clarify about this new idea of like the data notation pipeline, you know, and these new thoughts that are coming to the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like the annotation task and, you know, a little bit of what's going on out there because i know you know like the idea of using you know uh, you know like the idea you pointed about using experts you know who get more weights in terms of their decisions versus other people and i'm just curious if um like on a practical note how would sort of like an organization approach that or you know a society because i think uh, thinking through the data annotation process will be what uh, sort of democratizes AI for radiology, if anyone in the world can access good level data. Right, right. Yeah, so um, I think uh, you touched on two things. Like one, what does the data labeling, you know, infrastructure would look like? Um, um, and also like, how do we deal with the performance of various annotators, right? Is that a fair understanding of the question? Judy? Yes, yes. So okay. you, um, you mentioned uh, in your presentation, like Andrej, you know, Kapathi is studying. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was a very interesting talk. I encourage uh, you to check it out if you have time. So the idea is, uh, you know, um, when we started programming, uh, it's all about writing clear instructions, right? Like, okay, go right, go left. If you find this, turn left. So things like that, right? And uh, if, you, if you think about it, most of the inf software infrastructure is based on these rules today. Um, and uh, in some use cases, these rules can get really, really complex. And uh, the trend we're seeing in especially computer vision is, uh, and image processing is more and more components are becoming end to end. Like now you know, so even to identify a cat was a very big deal, like a decade ago, right? You have to write like a lot of code to identify a dog. And now you just train a model with enough data to get that job done. And now people are going even further. Um, so uh, for example, uh, OCR, right? Like text recognition in text. Uh, in the you know uh, text recognition, um, um, so people used to do um, a lot of image processing in the data to get the histograms and find where the data uh, text is, and then uh, a lot of steps later you get the final answer. And then a few years back, uh, people started doing um, bonding box around text and then translate that bonding box into actual characters. 
And slowly, we're actually doing end-to-end -end OCR, right? You just feed the image with any text anywhere in the image, and you spit out the characters. So what this trend means is you, one, you have enough, uh, you know, compute which can crunch numbers very fast. And uh, even algorithm-wise, like n right now, most of us hand code the neural networks. But uh, slowly, I think we will be able to at least portions of neural network auto create, uh, you know, uh, optimize the neural network structure as also as a learning process. So what do people do after, uh, you know, you have the data and you have the algorithms, uh, you, you have the computer and you have the algorithms, right? The, the main um, value from users would be data. So that's the main premise of um, um, Andrei Kapati's talk, like software to stack would center around data. Um, and uh, what is important is building this infrastructure to make this data collection and labeling easier. So that's the um, idea of the talk. Um, um, yeah, so your yeah, second question was about, uh, um, you know, how do you deal with these varying uh, uh, performance of the annotators, right? Um, so we use a few third-party annotator companies, and um, it, it works really well. Uh, the test questions concept works really well. Um, so uh, every page, for example, if they have like 10 things to annotate in every page, one in those 10 would be a test question where we already know the answer, right? But we still ask the um, annotator to do it. And that gives us a baseline on how good that uh, annotator is doing. And if that annotator is, you know, getting all the test questions wrong, then uh, we don't use his or her annotations. Um, that actually works pretty well. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. We have, so uh, we have for, uh, one more question, and we have a question from Alexandra Kadrin. Uh, should we annotate small data sets locally in our institutions to validate the performance of deep learning models trained for the same task on other data sets? Um, so, sorry, I don't think I completely got the question, but uh, so if you have a small data set locally, like how small, like maybe like thousands of samples uh, or hundreds? So let's say uh, the Mira data set that is uh, a Stanford uh, data, can you extrapolate that into your own institution's data to see if it's valid? Would that be uh, something of interest, uh, uh, probably an external validation? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. So, uh, so the idea is you, train a model on Mura data set and maybe fine tune uh, or, and validate on your set, right? On your local data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that will be a very good validation uh, of both the model generalizability. Is it able to like generalize to, potentially you must be using like slightly different infrastructure for, uh, you know, X-rays and uh, um, there could be like many different things which can affect the distribution shift, right? So it will be interesting to see if the model actually is able to generalize to, uh, yeah, new data. So um, I'm just going to jump in here, but um, I think, you know, we're coming to the top of the hour, but uh, I did want to mention that um, just to the attendees, because some of them will start to drop off, that our next general club is actually on how to implement some of the machine learning tools into your institution. Um, Ross Felice, who's at Georgetown, will be the one of the guests uh, in August. Uh, and uh, I think this is interesting because, uh, you know, all of us sort of are in different roles, but as you start to think about this, things, um, as I read this paper, I looked back at all our journal clubs and figured out that if you were attending, you'd actually understand what this paper was about, which is a good place to get, you know, a lot of radiologists to get to, even if you're not doing the AI stuff, because you can actually understand and you may not appreciate the, uh, you know, the mathematical algorithms, but you can 
sort of make out 90% of the paperwork. So I, I'm curious, you know, I'm curious to hear what are you excited about over the next coming months from each of you and sort of some parting shots uh, for the attendees. Um, it doesn't have to be AI, but, um, you know, we really appreciate everyone's time for being our guest. Dr. Anouk, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I'm really excited about uh, the idea of radiologists um, kind of asking the questions, creating the sets, and finding the answers themselves. And I, I really would like to, to see it kind of at that, that kind of groundswell level. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I completely am a believer in cross-domain uh, expertise. Uh, I think there's a lot we can do uh, when you know people with different expertise can come together. Uh, I'm especially interested in um, you know uh, understanding are there any tropical diseases which is not getting enough attention for you know economic reasons, um, which might be you know a good things to automate. Uh, where there is clear, uh, you know, shortage of doctors, for example, right? Um, yeah, so I would love to know your thoughts on it. Um, are there any problems that come to your mind uh, which you wish you could solve if you if, just if you had like 48 hours in a day, right? <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, so um, I'm pretty excited uh, what comes up in that space. And also another thing I wanted to actually bring up during my talk is I recently read this paper about uh, uh, using unlabeled data to generate representations. Um, um, I, will, I will send Judy the paper. Uh, the idea is, uh, um, you know, you can learn representations without enough label data. I think that would be really, really powerful in domains like radiology, um, where labor is expensive, uh, but you do have data, right? Um, so um, yeah, I'm excited to um, keep uh, you know talking to you guys further. So uh, I'm I'm going to sort of uh, mm -hmm. attempt the answer for tropical, <laughs> so that you have some answer. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you know actually the Sunpop Group has done a lot in. You know, I think they have a pro a program in India for diabetes and AI. You know, diabetic retinopathy, and I think they're running a new trial somewhere in Ghana. Um, for me, I, you know, I think, you know, first of all, if I think of my home in Kenya, there isn't enough, you know, digital documents, uh, you know, sort of uh, hanging around. And then when you think about the representative data set. You know, all patients we image, you know, where in an institution in the U.S., you know, you can find 70 percent being normal. And that's OK, because, you know, that helps guide management uh, in places like Kenya. You find that most of that imaging is abnormal because you only really get it once the patient is very sick. You know, that's and it. I wonder if sort of like looking at bias and sort of like being representative and also the tropical distribution of disease, you know, is pretty important and has to be done with researchers from a local context, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so, but definitely there are many things you can think about like malaria, um, slides, if you could even just do the binary classification to similar to like Mura paper where you have normal, abnormal and have the abnormal ones reviewed by someone else you know, so that you can sort of speed up time to start anti-malarials, that that would still have an impact. And uh, I know the Data Science Institute here is trying to, uh, from the American College of Radiology, is trying to write these use cases. But the truth is, in my opinion, I just think it's just so hard to figure out that's what's helpful and impactful. And I'm excited to sort of see where unsupervised learning and just figuring out new clusters like data discovery, I feel would have sort of like the most impact when it comes to translating some of the AI techniques to medicine in general and radiology. Like for example, what are the clusters of patients who get imaging? You know, why do they get imaging? Do they do better? You know, so you can start to link those things with outcomes. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll look up the uh, ones you mentioned, Judy. Thanks so much. Yeah. Patricia, do you want to end the session and tell us what you're excited about? 
Sure. Um, you know, as a, a trainee myself, I think that all of us have some tasks or specific studies that we feel like it, it, we would love that an AI algorithm would basically read for us. It's one of which is the, the bone age. Uh, so some of the uh, less um, complex studies that um, for someone that is learning or even for for an expert, it can be a little tedious to read. Um, I think I'm excited to have um, a machine learning do those tasks for me. So I would like to just thank you all the uh, Travia and Dr. Stein for um, being here with us today and all our attendees. Uh, thank you, Judy, for organizing and um, We'll see you guys next time. We will have the recording on the YouTube channel, uh, and we also have the, the hashtag on Twitter, so we can continue the conversation there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.